By now, the importance of Dead Rising on the zombie genre is well documented. It pioneered open-world zombie games with its wacky combat, unique mechanics, unforgettable side characters, and its illustrious protagonist, Frank. But people tend to forget that the series did continue to evolve past simply taking pictures and hitting zombies with mannequin crotches, and actually its sequel, Dead Rising 2, would set the standard for a lot of the gameplay mechanics going forward. Bizarrely, Dead Rising 2 was not outright developed by Capcom. It was instead sourced out to Canadian developer Blue Castle Games, later renamed Capcom Vancouver, who had garnered attention for their baseball game series, The Bigs. That ball gets through into left field. Polanco is going for two, safe at second base and this sort of game apparently made Capcom go, wow, these guys are who we need to make a Dead Rising 2. Well, a Capcom staff member would say that Blue Castle Games was picked for Dead Rising 2 because they had an emulator to make more zombies on screen. Guess it's as good a reason as any. There's no doubt that it was a gamble hiring another developer to make a sequel to one of their most promising franchises, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as it sold over 2.2 million copies after around four months of being released. So in the short term, hiring Capcom Vancouver was a great idea. In the long term, not so much. Dead Rising 2 marks the time when the franchise moved into the mainstream, as its popularity led to it being one of the most supported games in the series, including costume packs, two-story DLCs, and bizarrely, another version of the game where Frank is the main character, rather than Chuck. Dead Rising 2 takes place in 2011, five years after Frank's outing in Willamette, and several outbreaks have sprouted all over America, and zombies have been around for so long to the point where it's become normal to have a game show focusing on them. You play as Chuck Green, an ex-pro motorcyclist who's struggling to make money for his daughter Katie, as she's infected with the zombie virus, but keeps it at bay with Zombrex, a drug that was trialled on Frank at the end of Dead Rising. While while the game is built on the foundations of the first Dead Rising, giving the player the freedom of exploration, having missions be split into cases, psychos, and a tight time schedule. It adds many new layers to the formula that makes the gameplay feel less rigid and gives the player even more freedom than what was available in the first game, making it one of my personal favourite sequels, up there with Duke Nukem Forever and Rayman Raving Rabbits 2. Several years after the world was introduced to zombies, the people who have been infected by the virus have to take a drug known as Zombrex that suppresses the virus rather than just flat out cure it. And this set of circumstances directly affects the main protagonist, Chuck Green, as him and his family were in the middle of the New Vegas outbreak that caused his wife to die and his daughter, Katie, to become infected. Since the drug has to be taken every 24 hours, buying Zombrex is pretty expensive. So to make quick cash, Chuck enters into a game show called Terror is Reality, a show where four contestants kill waves of undead in over-the-top and dangerous ways. The show is hosted by Tyrone King, or TK for short, and his two assistants Amber and Crystal Bailey, a pair of twins who seem to take sibling love to a whole new level. At the same time the show is going on, an activist group known as Cure is holding protests over the treatment of zombies on the game show. It's a good job none of them witnessed the shit Frank was doing to the zombies in the first Dead Rising. I guess I should mention that the game takes place in Fortune City, Nevada, described as an adult playground Ground. The city consists of several casinos, restaurants, malls, and tons of other uh, exciting locations that make Fortune City a great setting for a zombie game, as it's basically Willamette, if Willamette had a cocaine binge in its early 20s. After the game show has ended, zombies mysteriously break free from their pens and start attacking the visitors of Fortune City, and so Chuck grabs Katie and heads straight for the safe house, now furnished with an anti-zombie door. No need to blowtorch that one shut. In the safe house, he meets Raymond Sullivan, a security officer in charge of the shelter, and Stacy Forsyth, one of the leaders of Cure. Everyone knows that this point that the people you meet in the safe house will be major characters in the story, which these guys most definitely are. While Frank was more of an observer in the story, getting involved when he really didn't have to, Chuck is directly involved in the plot as he is framed for releasing the zombies, despite the camera footage not showing the perpetrator's face top-tier journalism. And so for the next 72 hours, he has to find evidence to clear his name with the help of Stacy and his new reporter friend, Rebecca Chang. Having the protagonist be at the heart of the story was a great way to get you invested because you actively want to clear Chuck's name, which may persuade people who only ever played Dead Rising to kill zombies to actually put the effort into finishing the story. In typical Dead Rising fashion, there's many plot twists along the way, an overtime mode, multiple endings that change depending on your actions, and real-time cutscenes that always make everything 10 times better. Some people may have been upset that Frank didn't return for the second game, and they have a right to be. Frank was an iconic character
character for Capcom, due to not being the typical flawless hero type. His goals at the start of the game are pretty selfish, as he's only there to get the big story, but as the game goes on, he becomes more of a hero, even though he is a little unhinged. Chuck is a very different kind of protagonist, as right off the bat, he seems like a heroic character, even when villainised by some of the blue-pilled NPCs around him, and the fact that he's basically doing all of it for his daughter is quite heartbreaking, as he has to actively do all this dangerous stuff just to keep her alive. He has a more serious demeanour to him, rather than being quick-witted and quippy like Frank was, and when he does make a joke, it makes it even funnier, because he sounds like he's forcing it out of himself. I saw what you did there. Although Frank will always be my favourite protagonist of the series, Chuck is a close second, as he's arguably just as iconic as Frank. Side characters are important for a great Dead Rising experience, as they usually make up most of the entertainment during quiet, non-zombie killing moments. Stacy is Chuck's eye in the sky, looking over the monitors and seeing what fun shenanigans are happening in Fortune City. Despite her importance as the quest giver, she is incredibly boring, and doesn't get much to do besides argue with Sullivan every once in a while, and act as a forced love interest for Chuck, even though the have absolutely no chemistry between them. This aspect should have been reserved for resident baddie, Rebecca Chang. Rebecca is a reporter working for Channel 6 Action News, and is the one responsible for breaking the news on Chuck's involvement in the zombie outbreak, and so she is the first person Chuck goes to to confront. Rebecca shares a lot more similarities with Frank than Chuck does. Besides being an investigative journalist, she's dead set on getting the story of a lifetime, repeats a lot of the same psychotic shit Frank says, Fantastic. and isn't afraid to talk to potentially dangerous individuals, shown when she is at first wary of Chuck for his potential involvement in the outbreak, but then quickly changes her demeanour when she realises the potential groundbreaking story she might have on her hands. Rebecca feels like the Brad of Dead Rising 2, as she is actively working outside of the safe house and helps Chuck along the way, which makes her one of my favourite characters in the game. Her and Chuck have a great dynamic throughout the story, and Chuck being down bad after his wife died really wants a piece of that reporter, but of course, if you're an interesting enough character, things just don't go your way. Sullivan is another main character in the story, and acts as the opposing force in the safe house. Straight away being introduced to him, you know he's going to be a prick, and boy that word doesn't begin to describe him. All throughout the story, Sullivan is finding ways to be argumentative, and of course jumps at Chuck's throat when the TV says Chuck caused the outbreak. The Matrix is strong. Although you kind of get why he's so concerned, because he was put in charge of keeping the safe house, well, safe. So when a potential threat is coming and going in the vent, it would make him a little uneasy. I'm sure under his tough exterior, he's actually just a sweetened, caring guy. Now let's talk about the antagonists of the game. As Chuck and Rebecca dig deeper into the cause of the outbreak, it's revealed that TK was involved in the plot against Chuck, and has hired a small army of mercenaries to help him loot the city. To get more information on TK and his involvement, Rebecca asks Chuck to come meet with her source, as they have been the ones feeding her information. However, this meeting turns out to be a trap, as Rebecca's source turns out to be Crystal and Amber, who after trapping Rebecca, try to kill Chuck. After Chuck kills one of the twins, the other one will game end themselves, as they can no longer get some incest action, and Rebecca and Chuck race to stop TK from leaving the city, which leads to one of the greatest boss fights ever, Helicopter versus Box. After TK fails to leave, Chuck and Rebecca take him back to the safe house, where they sit and wait for the military to come and save them. Now although the military in the first Dead Rising turned out to be evil, you had to admire their effectiveness in killing zombies, so surely after many years of there being zombies, the army must be even more prepared than they were in the first game. Oh, they got shit on in the first 10 minutes of being there. Turns out TK's involvement was only surface level, and there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. Like the green gas that's seeping out of the underground tunnels, causing zombies to become faster and stronger. This leads to the discovery of a lab underneath Fortune City that has been built by Phenotrans, the company responsible for the creation and distribution of Zombrex, in order to farm queens to make more Zombrex. Chuck, finally having the proof he needs, goes back to his friends at the safe house to give them the good news, and hands over a transceiver to Rebecca, so she can call her station to come pick up the survivors. I guess all's well and ends well for Chuck and the gang.
Wait, Sullivan was a bad guy? Wait, what? Sullivan's actually an agent of Phenotrans, and explains that Fortune City was a necessary loss to farm queens because some of America's best are infected, like doctors, politicians, and gamers. Chuck sees through Sullivan's self-righteousness and sends half his body on holiday, and calls Channel 6 Action News to come pick him, Katie, and the rest of the survivors up. Of course, like Dead Rising 1, there are multiple endings depending on what you have done in the story. One leads to overtime mode, where you face off against TK for the final time. One leads to all the survivors leaving you behind, because you get trapped in a lift by Zombie TK, which is the canon ending, shown by Case West. An ending where you get shot by Sullivan, one where you get arrested by the military, and one where you give up on life because you didn't give Katie Zombrex, which is honestly too sad to show. Dead Rising 2 carries on the legacy of Dead Rising, and at the same time embraces new ideas that don't retract from the core experience, but instead let you express yourself in a more artistic way. And by artistic, I mean violent. The game still works on a 72 hour plus in-game time frame, and lets you spend this time in pretty much any way you want. Killing zombies, saving survivors, and beating psychopaths into submission. But you can't do these things unless you have the right tools for the job. Using mannequin crotches just won't cut it anymore, and the mini chainsaw isn't in this game. Now you may be thinking, how is it even possible to survive for three plus days without my mini chainsaw and mannequin crotches? Well I'll tell you, combo weapons. Possibly the single greatest mechanic implemented into a Dead Rising game, whereas the camera was an interesting gimmick that would be entertaining every so often. Combo weapons revolutionised the way you kill zombies in the series forever, and the days of simply bashing an enemy with a bat were gone, and were replaced by having a robot bear shoot an LMG for you. From that example alone, you can see just how unique the mechanic is, and how important it was to move the combat of the series forward. Dead Rising's combat was simple yet satisfying. The array of weapons at your fingertips led to great moments, but replicating that again in another game may have disappointed some fans, and would possibly be seen as Capcom basically admitting that the combat was never going to evolve from that point on. Don't get me wrong, there are still loads of fun weapons that aren't combo weapons. Guns, marbles, moose head, dildo, but most of the entertainment comes from picking up different weapons and seeing which ones go together. Dead Rising 2 has a level up system, and like in the first game, you unlock new moves, more health, and more inventory spaces as you progress. However, as well as these, you also unlock combo cards most times when you level up. Combo cards are essentially recipes that teach you how to make certain combo weapons, and while you don't need them to make the combo weapons, having the combo card for the weapon you are using grants you the special move and or PP bonuses for that specific weapon, as well as unlocking combo cards when levelling up. Certain cards can only be unlocked by viewing certain advert boards in Fortune City, saving certain survivors, and defeating certain psychos. It adds another reason to replay the game, as much like how real life people get addicted to collecting Pokemon cards, football shirts, and dirty heroin needles, you feel the urge to find and unlock all of them. It's clear that the combat has had a massive overhaul, but there's also been a change that although may seem subtle, does wonders for the enjoyment of the game, and that's the transceiver change. The most notorious feature of Dead Rising is hands down the transceiver, as it leads to some really stressful and enraging moments. Otis may seem like a sweet old man, but he's actually a massive dick, constantly calling you while you're surrounded by zombies, then complaining when you put the phone down. To be honest Otis, I'm kind of glad you died in Dead Rising 3. Thankfully, Blue Sky took mercy on us and decided to change how the transceiver worked in the sequel. While it's still used as a means to give Chuck scoops, you don't have to worry about answering the calls out of fear of losing them. A state Stacey will give you the information in the form of a text. A change like this actually encourages the player to do more missions and save more survivors. And speaking of survivors, they aren't actually as brain dead as they were in the first Dead Rising, which makes the whole activity of taking survivors back to the safe house not so migraine inducing. Now if you plan on ignoring these missions because you can't be asked going back to the safe house constantly, then you're going to love Katie, because every 24 hours you have to give her Zombrex to stop her from turning into a zombie. And since you're stuck in Fortune City for a while, you have to do this a number of times. Zombrex can be found in many hidden places throughout many popular locations on the map, but if you can't be bothered looking for Zombrex, then you can always splash some cash on some at your nearest pawn shop. $25,000? Sorry Katie, you aren't worth that much. Seeing as how you're stuck in the heart of one big casino essentially, it would be a shame to let all that money go to waste. Dead Rising 2 introduces a currency system that lets you buy items from pawn shops set up by resident looters. These shops, along with giving you easier access to Zombrex, 
also let you buy deadly weapons and keys to some of the vehicles present around the map. But when you actually look at the prices of them, you'll realise that walking isn't so bad. Dead Rising had some bonus activities for you to do that would give you bonus PP, like running on a treadmill, frying a pan, and taking photos of PP stickers. And Dead Rising 2 has a lot more of these little bonuses for you to try out, like gambling your life savings away, posing for a funny photo, and looking at naked ladies. Little things like this may seem insignificant when compared to the introduction of combo cards, but they make the world feel a lot more interactable than it was in the first game, and whereas you would often avoid certain parts of the map in the first game, these features make you want to look around and see what other secrets you can find. Of course, you have to be careful where you're looking, because you just might find someone that doesn't want you around. Snowflake hungry. Some of Dead Rising's most recognisable characters come in the form of the psychopaths, who act as mini-bosses for the player to beat during certain scoops. The reason they are so iconic is because of their over-the-top behaviour that's both disturbing and yet entertaining at the exact same time. They are what gave the game so much personality in the first place, and the psychos of Dead Rising 2 do a good job at emulating this same kind of energy. However, rather than being outright scary, a lot of them are kind of funny. Don't get me wrong, some of them are still intimidating, but just the way they interact with Chuck in such a delusional and angered way just makes you laugh. Much like the first game, a lot of them use unique weapons and when defeated can give you special items like their weapons, combo cards and other bonuses to help you in Fortune City. A unique aspect about many of the psychopaths in this game is they are connected to Chuck in some way. Frank was an observer in the Willamette incident. He wasn't there when the outbreak started and was only there to get the story of a lifetime, but since Chuck is unwillingly connected with the outbreak happening, some of the psychos hold a grudge towards him. Of of course, some of them are just dickheads anyway, like Leon Bell. Leon was a fellow contestant on Terror's reality, alongside Chuck, and actually has a nice conversation with him before the game begins. Hey buddy, I heard you lost your wife in Vegas. I guess you suck at killing zombies, otherwise she'd still be around! <laughs> After this, you run into him riding around the silver strip on his slicicle, cutting down a survivor and roasting Chuck some more. Wow, I guess his full name must be Leon Bellend. While he may seem hard to beat at first, much like how trees were your best friends against the convicts, you can use them to your advantage against Leon too, and after he sets himself on fire like a true gamer, you can use his truck to customise your bike. Brandon is another psycho that is connected to Chuck, however he's the only one that starts out the conversation admiring Chuck. A former member of Cure, he looks like Shaggy if instead of binging Scooby Snacks, he binges Shrooms, and proclaims to Chuck that he is now fully sold on his plan to unleash zombies across Fortune City. However, as we know, Chuck didn't actually do it, and he tries to explain this to Brandon, but this hippie isn't having any of it, and so he attacks Chuck, but then when Chuck reminds him to get a job, he just can't take it anymore. The next two psychos only attack Chuck because they believe he started the outbreak, which makes them feel a lot more sympathetic and reasonable than other psychos throughout the series, like Slappy, the creepy resident mascot who blames Chuck for getting his equally creepy girlfriend killed, and instead of talking it out, decides to light you on fire. Carl is another Another psycho who attacks Chuck on the basis that he started the outbreak, but the only reason he's doing this is because he believed Chuck disrupted his perfect record as a postman, and so tries to blow him up with deadly parcels. Carl takes going postal to a whole other level. Hi there, would you like to sign my petition? Okay, I guess that sounds pretty good. Thanks. This is why it was such a good narrative choice to have Chuck be involved in the plot, because it allows for psychos with more layers, rather than just being crazy. But don't worry, there's plenty of 100% mental psychos. Many individuals came to Fortune City because it's almost portrayed as a promise of a better life. It's like a big stage to go and show the public what you're made of, and many of these guys lost their minds when the outbreak happened, because it meant they weren't getting their big break. Like Anton, a chef who's waiting on a food critic to come and make him world famous. Yeah man, I don't think you'd even get rewarded with a jar of piss with that food. People needed some entertainment in Fortune City, and Reed and Roger are here to fill that role. These guys are trying to make it big by performing dangerous tricks, but unfortunately end up killing a person, and Reed's reaction to Chuck's concern gets me every time. Hey, that's not magic. She's dead. Oh, look at Mr. Big Guy here. 
These guys don't have anything on the next psycho though. BB is a singer, desperate to hold on to what little fame she has left, and will stop at nothing to get it back, which means Chuck has to go along with her instructions if he wants to save her hostages, and even BB herself. Some people just came to Fortune City to find love, like Mega Virgin Randy, who is definitely up there with some of the freakier psychos in the series, as he captures random women to be his brides, and if they don't agree to marry him, he kills them. And this irredeemably evil madman must have an equally eerie boss theme, right? Guess not. There are many other psychos throughout the game, like Seymour, a more security guard, Sergeant Boykin, a soldier who survived the initial attack of the super zombies and earned the rank of severe PTSD sufferer, some redneck snipers that shoot anything that moves because America, Ted, a guy who hates people but loves his pet tiger Snowflake, and Snowflake herself, who you can tame and give to your daughter Katie. Yeah, I don't think Chuck is all that sane himself. Most of the game's features, like its psychos, story and gameplay, are made so much better by the soundtrack. Though I will say the game's main soundtrack isn't as good as the originals, the psycho themes are some of the best boss music I've ever heard. The game does have a main composer, who made a lot of bangers for the game to be fair, but the best songs were done by Cell Dweller and Blue Stally. These guys are what made the psychopath fight so memorable, because it wasn't the actual fights themselves, I'll tell you that much. Despite all of the improvements made from the first game, human combat really wasn't amongst these improvements. Blue Castle must have been fans of getting stunlocked over and over again by machine gunfire, so they decided to put it straight back into the sequel. This makes any interaction with gun-wielding enemies so dull. I wish they made psycho fights more interesting, and yes, some of them have unique attacks, but the gameplay is just broken and not that interesting, especially when you can beat pretty much any boss with an LMG. But the biggest piss take has to be the mutated zombies. The rate in which you get grabbed is bad enough anyway, but when you times that by 10 and add in the fact that they can throw up on you and stunlock you for a good few seconds, makes the endgame of Dead Rising 2 so frustrating. Frustrating. This felt like a poor attempt at making the game more difficult, because the devs realised that the game was pretty easy, but surely there was a better way of making things difficult. Overtime mode was also pretty disappointing, because it was basically copy and pasted from the first game, which just made it feel predictable. Despite these pretty shitty aspects, the rest of the game is great, and Dead Rising 2 was definitely a step in the right direction for the series, and it's crazy to think about how well Blue Castle Games started off, and then just decided to nosedive the series into the floor with the fourth game.